Um, so uh, when Suzanne invited me to talk about uh, teaching interdisciplinary science, what's the first thing you do when ask, somebody asks you a question? <laughs> I Googled it, <laughs> right? I mean, I knew what I was talking about, but I wanted to make sure that we were going to be on the same page. So if you just Google interdisciplinary, this comes up, and it's actually not too bad, I think, um, of or relating to more than one branch of knowledge. So that's pretty broad. That worked. I was comfortable with that. But then, you know, so you've got this little button down here, and I couldn't resist. I had to click it. And look what it shows you, <laughs> how this word is used. Okay, so first, this is a graph out of a dictionary, so cut them some slack. I realize it's missing a few key components. <laughs> However, it is kind of interesting, right? If you look at the time scale here, and it's just talking about how frequently you see this word coming up in the literature, this is when we started investing in science and technology for entirely political reasons. And look at that, it just keeps going, right? Because the more we do, the more we realize that the problems we're working with are so complex, you can't possibly solve them with one discipline, right? The problems that we're dealing with now, like global climate change, make going to the moon look fairly straightforward and easy, right? Dangerous, but pretty straightforward. So um, this, this is interdisciplinary thinking is something that has been growing, but we're all here because we're trying to figure out how to make it penetrate <laughs> both our education system and our practice of, of science, right? So the question is, why hasn't it penetrated? So you've all crossed those boundaries. What are some of the challenges that prevent us from moving into interdisciplinary education and then practices? You've all run into them. <laughs> Different languages, okay. What else? Yeah. Okay, so you just don't know what's going on in those other disciplines, right? What else? Okay, we're used to working in silos. We're good with that. <laughs> what else have we got? Anybody else? Yeah. Right, right. How are we going to cover everything? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're not, the, the career trajectory is not set up to recognize interdisciplinary work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, path of least resistance rather than bushwhacking the whole way. Okay. So, yeah, um, there are lots of these that we've all run into, and uh, we know that it's not, it's, you know, it's a good idea, but there are lots of reasons that it doesn't happen. Um, and in particular, I want to talk about um, disciplinary um, practices and ways of thinking. Uh, I was at Nescent uh, doing education and outreach there, and one of my roles was to sit in on the working groups and catalysis meetings, and I was looking for potential collaborations for education and outreach. Um, but what I could watch was how these people coming from dis different disciplines were trying to talk to each other and what the barriers were and how they worked around them. And so I really think that this disciplinary practices is, is really kind of important. Um, it it really shapes how we come at problems, which is both a strength and weakness of interdisciplinary interactions. So just to sort of remind us how uncomfortable it is to leave your disciplinary practice, I'm just going to do a little exercise here. <laughs> I want you to just take a few seconds here and think about what you know about this. And like anything is fair game, right? <laughs> anything is fair game. So I'll just give you a couple seconds, think about it. 
All right, so what do you know about this? Anything. It's the Hardy-Weinberg equation. What else do we know about it? <laughs> it's never true. <laughs> How many students have gotten to the end of the lesson and said, seriously, you just taught me something that is never true? <laughs> Well, anybody? <laughs> no mutation, no migration, no selection, two cell dies or three cell dies. Okay, no this, this comes with some assumptions, right? And, and you are all familiar with those assumptions, more or less, right? You knew there were some assumptions. Some of you know Which what they're Okay, so this is actually representing stuff going on in a, a biological population. Why do we call it Hardy Weinberg? Hardy was a mathematician, <laughs> yay! <laughs> <laughs> Look, it was interdisciplinary! <laughs> okay, all right, so we know some stuff about this. Some of us know more, some of us know less, some of us have used it, some of us have avoided it. Whatever. All right. We know about that. <laughs> okay, it's DNA. What else do you know about that? Rosalind Franklin. There's a name that goes with DNA. What else? It has genes. They code for everything. All right. What else have we got? <laughs> too static, too rigid? It never looks that way. No. Oh, yeah, all right. So you have a beef with the illustration here. <laughs> okay, all right. Hodgkin Huxley? Hmm? Hodgkin Huxley? Oh, wrong one. No. <laughs> okay, all right. Oh, this stuff can coil up, yeah. So it's flexible, it can coil. What else do we know about it? All right, let me ask you this. What are some misconceptions about this? Have you ever heard anyone say, well, I don't believe in genetically modified plants because they shouldn't have DNA in them? <laughs> Watson and Crick, there we go. There's a good name. <laughs> good name said. Okay, so we know some stuff about this. We don't know some stuff about this. Um, some of us are more comfortable with this, some of us are less comfortable with this, okay? All right, this is still science. It's a little further out of our realm. What is this? This is the sun, yes. What do you know about the sun? <laughs> okay, so we got composition, we've got that it's a star. What else do we know? Where do you get your information about? this kind of thing that's out of your discipline? Wikipedia! <laughs> Always a good place to start. <laughs> hmm? Grade school. Okay, so we're working sometimes off of older information. I get a lot of my information about what goes on in space from watching movies. <laughs> okay. Facebook, yeah. Here we go. <laughs> that's right. So when we come to something that's a little out of our wheelhouse, we're often bringing information that we may have gotten from school, from songs, from movies. Um, I follow the NASA Twitter, and half of their tweets are, this is so cool, and the other half are, let us just debunk this myth or misconception, right? So we come with a lot of misconceptions about this. Okay, so um, now, one step further. As a nod to succinct, what's this? Okay, so nescent and succinct are organizations very much like Nimbus, the same idea, they're synthesis centers. Nescent was the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center. 
I just closed its doors in June. Sad. Um, Succinct is bringing together mathematics and social sciences. Right? Or we can uh, give us a natural sciences. Natural sciences. Okay. All right. So these are centers like Nimbus that are designed to cross those disciplinary boundaries and be bring people together to address big questions. All right. Uh, this is the Supreme Court building. Yes! <laughs> what do you know about the Supreme Court? Because one could argue it's actually kind of important. It impacts your life. What do we know about it? Anything. Anything at all. <laughs> Nine. Yes. What else? Anything? Come on, you know, you know. Huh? Appointed for life by the president. Then there's that confirmation process, right? Okay, are you a little uncomfortable trying to talk about the Supreme Court, especially since you came for a math bio conference? Yeah, this is, it's uncomfortable to come out of where you know everything. And, and probably the rules about how we think and talk about um, what happens in the Supreme Court are different from what we s how we do it in a math bio conference, for example. Okay, so with that in mind, that's there, it's it's uncomfortable to come out of your discipline. Um, my my main interest is helping people over that first hump. Right? If I'm a biologist and I'm ready to dip my toe in the water, not to be thrown in the deep end, John, <laughs> but if I'm ready <laughs> and I'm going to try it, um, then how can we lower that barrier? And vice versa, if I'm a mathematician, I would like to go into biology. How do we lower that barrier? So I have a couple of ideas that I'd like to share with you. And the first is watching out for expert blind spots. Okay? Because you cannot assume when you go into an interdisciplinary conversation that everybody's coming to the table with the same information, right? Um, you know, uh, you talked a little bit about modeling and, and, you know, that there are constraints, that there are assumptions. Um, those may not be obvious to people from outside of mathematics, right? And so, um, starting to use models is challenging because you don't understand that you can, you know, how you can work with those constraints, right? Um, so looking for your expert blind spots, and they're blind spots, so that makes it harder, right? <laughs> so being very sensitive to where you are making assumptions about what people know. Uh, misconceptions, right? We all have misconceptions about things that we have not studied. Right? We come with misconceptions about virtually everything. I've done a lot of work in evolution. That comes with a load of um, misconceptions. But I've been talking to my chemistry colleagues, and they said everything you know about water is a lie. Okay? And then they left. They didn't even explain what the lie was. I thought that was really cruel. But so it doesn't matter where you're coming from. You're going to have some misconceptions when you enter a new area. So when you're dealing with um, interdisciplinary work, then you have to be aware of where other people's misconceptions may be. And it doesn't matter if you're dealing with your peers or students. Your peers may have the same misconceptions because it wasn't relevant in their primary area of study. It's never been addressed for them. So, and either of those can really derail a conversation because you're going to talk right past each other. Okay, and then using big ideas, okay? Uh, the Vision and Change Report recommended that we move away from um, lots of content and really emphasize the five core concepts, as they called them. So evolution, systems, structure and function, transfer of energy, and transmission of information, okay? Big ideas. And what I realized when I was working at Nessent was that when you talk about big ideas, things like how do we feed the entire population of the earth in a sustainable fashion, that is an interesting and relevant question, right? 
everybody can get into that. And it's also accessible. It's such a big idea that you don't get buried in disciplinary details, right? You don't use jargon. You don't have to know any specifics. There are ways in for everybody if it's a big question like that. So these are three different things that, that I think may help us in thinking about interdisciplinary approaches. And so um, I wanted to just take a few minutes and show you some of the tools and resources that have been developed by um, BioQuest with these kinds of ideas in mind. Okay, so um, again, remembering that I'm really interested in lowering that initial barrier so that people can get comfortable in these interdisciplinary ways of thinking and then they can go where they will and take it wherever. <laughs> okay, so BioQuest has been around for 30 years. John is the founder and he was reminding me that um, it's the initial team was very interdisciplinary. Tell me again, an historian, mathematicians, biologists, philosopher, what else? Architect. An architect? That, okay, <laughs> science ed researchers. It has always been interdisciplinary. And I think you can see that reflected in the educational philosophy of BioQuest. Uh, it's the three Ps, don't count them, I know there are five there. Um, problem posing, problem solving, and peer persuasion. Now, BioQuest focuses on biological questions, but you could take this anywhere. This is just science, right? So you can take it across disciplines. It's not specific. So BioQuest has developed some resources for people to use in interdisciplinary studies introducing those kinds of things. Um, one that I wanted to just uh, touch on was these esteem, esteem modules. So there are Excel si simulations, right? We've, we're using Excel because that's uh, something that students know how to use, right? We're not worried about learning a new tool. And then uh, John is the master of acronyms. So Excel simulations and tools for exploratory essential mathematics esteem. But for each of these modules, so this is one on island biogeography, there's some information about the actual mathematics, the people who developed it, a little bit of information about um, what you can use this for. Um, it usually comes with some references, sometimes a tutorial. And then these are Excel modules that allow students to interact with the variables, see how that changes the outcomes, think about what that really means. And because these are meant to be introductory, they start out by pointing out what the assumptions are, right? So helping people understand the whole picture and make that transition to interdisciplinary thinking. This is another one um, that started at BioQuest and then has expanded and gone out on its own. Um, for this one, uh, sometimes if you have students entering a new discipline, they probably, you know, mathematicians, there was a question about, you know, uh, how do we help mathematicians, I mean, math students come to interdisciplinary projects? Well, they probably don't want to take a molecular biology course, but they do need to have some sense of what's going on. So things like this can help them get a sense of what the conversation is about, fill in some knowledge gaps. Um, so those are nice tools for helping bridge disciplinary gaps. Um, Numbers Count is a project that uh, BioQuest did with Claudia Neuhauser, um, and it focuses a lot on working with data sets, statistics, and calculus. Um, there are very simple, accessible sets to bring people in. This is just looking at different varieties of apples, how many seeds do they have on average? It's not a question you think about a lot, but actually it makes for a great activity because then everyone gets to snack while they do the um, analysis. <laughs> okay, but there are also wonkin big data sets in there. This is a, a cancer research data set, and it's just it's huge. 
Okay? So um, providing faculty with the tools to bring interdisciplinary questions to the classroom is one way to help uh, promote interdisciplinary activities. But we also think a lot about um, pedagogies that promote interdisciplinary action or interdisciplinary activities. Um, one of the areas that we've spent a lot of time in is thinking about how to use cases in the classroom. Um, and those are nice open-ended ways for students to come in. They can be very prescribed. They can be very open-ended. But knowing how to use a tool like that in the classroom can make it easier to do interdisciplinary work. Uh, problem spaces are a similar approach where instead of giving so much direction, you just mention some biological information, talk a little bit about HIV, give a list of tools, give some data sources, let the students ask a question and see where they go. Right? So it's still a little bit constrained, but it helps um, students figure out how to approach things from a lot of different directions. Um, CUBES is a project that um, BioQuest is involved in right now. And we're really thinking of CUBES as a virtual synthesis center. So much like Nimbus is bringing the community together, uh, we have some tools and resources that we are putting out there and asking the community to figure out what direction, what question they would like to ask. Um, Gabby is going to have a poster on it this afternoon. Um, Carrie's here. She can talk to you about it, too. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to take you through a lot of those details. Suffice it to say that um, we are using um, the Hub Zero platform out of uh, Purdue. And this was a platform that was designed to support scientific collaboration. So it supports the use of a lot of different kinds of mathematical software that maybe don't run so well when you use Google Docs to uh, do a collaboration. Um, and we have lots of different ways that groups can work there um, and share resources. And so uh, I invite you to come to the poster and learn a little bit more about how those pieces fit together. And I just wanted to thank all the people that I work with for really interesting conversations about this. If you can go back to the equation that you asked us about. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh, that was all the way back. Whoop, one too many. Sorry. There you go. Come on. There. Yes. So one of the things I do, um, and I can't help it, is I study mathematicians for a living. <laughs> and as you were talking about this idea of how we're influenced by our specialty, one of the things I noticed is that as soon as that equation was identified as Hardy-Weinberg, everyone interpreted your question as, tell me everything you can about Hardy-Weinberg, mm -hmm. not tell me everything you can about this equation. Mm -hmm. So for example, nobody mentioned that it was a degenerate conic. <laughs> and so I thought it was very interesting to see that as soon as we had a meaning for equation, the meaning became everything. Yes. And the equation itself kind of disappeared from the conversation. Yeah, yeah. There are lots of ways into almost any question. But um, as Leslie said, it's easier to follow the, the accepted known path. And so that's where we tend to stay. So yeah, interesting. Any other comments or questions? I was going to say perfect square trinomial because I was just teaching algebra the other day, but you know, <laughs> um, but I didn't. You're right. Um, so uh, I, I think uh, one of the big things you mentioned is misconceptions mm. and bringing to the table misconceptions. And even those of us who who feel like we're a little bit more familiar within math and biology have misconceptions. And and I remember um, one faculty member from wildlife biology saying that cycles were they just like the the whole hair thing. I mean the links. It, it's not really true, and 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 you know it's it's totally doesn't work that way, and and you know so what's the point of teaching that model, 
and and I was kind of like, oh, you just took away like something I know, <laughs> um, and that felt super uncomfortable. And now I feel like I, I have this obligation to go figure out and resolve this this problem that I have. Um, learning about DNA uh, was very different uh, when I had Bio One Hundred and One in in college. Never mind high school. Yeah. So I um, I think it's all of us, even even the ones that feel comfortable that that have carry a lot of misconceptions that we don't even know about. Yeah. I like the way you uh, framed a lot of what you're talking about in terms of comfort, because I think one of the biggest <laughs> barriers to interdisciplinary working together is that we're very uncomfortable as scientists with not knowing things. Mm -hmm. And that things like jargon, which jargon is a great way to communicate amongst your peers, but it's also a way of like identifying somebody who's not a peer because you say something and they have this look of like, oh my gosh, I don't know what that means <laughs> on their face. And I, you know, I think it's such a strong, like you don't know that kind of culture that we live in as scientists that we need to sort of very deliberately start trying to change that culture and be more open and welcoming in the way we talk. Like, well, for people who aren't familiar with this, this is this. Or you may have forgotten mm -hmm. this equation from many years ago as opposed to having so many things being like a barometer of how much somebody knows and how close we are in our discipline and our thinking. And I think that that, as much as anything, is a big barrier for people working together because we're so afraid of, like, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> Any other comments? Briefly. <laughs> yeah, I just want to say that's not what's necessarily valued in our discipline to talk to everybody and be able to have everybody understand what we're saying. From a math perspective, I remember somebody saying a candidate was coming to talk and your goal should be everybody can understand the first 10 minutes and nobody can understand the last five minutes. So <laughs> I, I, think <laughs> I, I think this is a question of values. Yeah, yeah.